Good afternoon on my behalf. I'm Marti Hönvilbrandt. I'm here, well, thank you to Aalto for the possibility and Mare Rembinen for the possibility to, to be here to discuss openness from a company perspective. I will try to give you, in general, a view why companies want to open, what's the benefit for companies to open, uh, uh, and how do they decide what to open when they want to open something. And then I'll uh, make a very bold uh, um, foray with uh, one slide and, and uh, think a little bit how does it, how would it look like from a researcher perspective, individual re researcher perspective. So, um, very briefly, my background, uh, I'm a tech lawyer heading a tech practice at HS Partners. We have five to six lawyers doing tech work there, and we also have an open tech practice there. Um, I believe we are the only f law firm that identifies as having an, a separate open tech practice. It, um, besides of being a lawyer, um, or as a part of my lawyer work, I also head a couple of associations, COS, the Center for Open Source Solutions, Open Systems and Solutions, Validus, that's an open source compliance uh, uh, focused association. And then there's Aero Island, that's a, um, artificial intelligence and robotics uh, uh, um, promoting association. I'm chairman of each of these. A little bit on the content of the speech here. I will be briefly touching, in a way, the whole picture on the open source in the enterprise. enterprise. Then uh, we'll discuss for a moment for why companies decide to participate in the open source projects. What's the benefit involved for them? Uh, what's the reasons? Uh, similarly, we discuss the opening products, uh, products as a strategy. What's, what's the, the, in a way, the, the uh, discussion points there, why to do it, and then uh, a few viewpoints regarding open da data business, as a business uh, um, perspective, and then, then, yeah, the last point, perhaps touching, uh, in a way, from a company perspective, uh, 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 how to maximize benefit from an author researcher viewpoint and what's the, the, in a way, the story about openness, why, why and how should the author researchers benefit out of openness. Very roughly, companies look at open source software solutions uh, from three perspectives. The one, a very uh, um, simple from a decision-making perspective, Obviously, every company involved with software needs to somehow use open source uh, in their products and in their offerings because it's just a way of making uh, uh, development faster um, and lowering costs. Others have put something into open, so if we don't use that, then uh, we are giving uh, um, an extra head start to our competitors. Then I won't be discussing this too much, um, or not, not at all actually after this. That's uh, from a decision-making perspective, that's pretty obvious. But then the, the next question I'll be discussing, why do companies contribute to open source projects? We, we come to the questions that the company starts to open up their IPR. And then the, the, in a way the core question there is that one must understand that IPR is just a legal phenomenon. A business phenomenon is, is that where is our competitive advantage and where, where is not? And, and how do we benefit out of our IPR in the best possible way? And we'll see that benefiting of your IPR in the best possible way, in a way, leads you to open certain areas of your IPR. And then we'll discuss a little bit business models, examples there. These are, in a way, the three. Um, accesses that companies need to think about when using open source software. As I mentioned, one is pretty familiar to each and every company doing working with software, but the number two and three, those are like uh, uh, 
some companies are very well working with contributing to open source project. It's a regular work for them. Others are considering whether they should or not. So this is like not something that's already done or this is a discussion point, this is a, a, a lear learning, uh, learning uh, um, process. Publishing, uh, that's even further down in the learning process, where, where, to, where to publish open source pro products. So just as a reminder, if you did not know this a couple of years back, that shows you who is doing Linux, the, the, the kernel project um, really the backbone of most of computer systems today. Um, if we look at the, the look at the, the there we have 13.6 percent of of code cannot be identified to any single company, but the rest of the code pretty much can be identified to companies. So uh, when we think about open source projects, forget that it's done by hobbyists. It's not done by hobbyists. It's done by companies. It's Companies pay for their employees to work on open source projects. Why they do that? Well, we'll see it very, very soon. So um, this just a generic. By the way, this is three years old. This this information. So so uh, um, I haven't I haven't checked whether this has been updated. But the point is clear. So why, why do these companies participate into the projects? Well, that's because they need Linux kernel for their products. They need Linux kernel for their business. And when they do that, they want to ensure that Linux kernel uh, uh, supports their business, whatever they are doing. And, and if, if, they, if they would not do that, then they would, in a way, increase the cost of their own development later on. They would need to develop more on top of Linux kernel one instead of them doing the development work directly in the Linux kernel. If you think about a company and its uh, product offering, you have a situation on day zero that uh, they get certain open source software, Linux kernel and other open source software on top of which they build their own product. Let's say that they need to develop something on top of the Linux kernel uh, in order to support its interaction with their proprietary, perhaps, solution. Uh, uh, then, uh, they do n if they do not contribute that to the project, to the open source project they are using, they will end up, in a couple of years, when they redo the next version of their own product, they will end up redeveloping the same adaptations, the same thing they did, they will end up redeveloping those again. And that's just not effective. They are... Uh, uh, doing work that they already did, did once, they are doing it again. And I've seen this happen a number of times in companies. The second time they realize it, that's perhaps not enough. It requires the third time. When they the third time are redeveloping the same features on top of the open source product, product then, uh, um, then they recognize, that, hey, perhaps it, should, it would be wiser to actually contribute these things to the project uh, uh, let the project take handle of hand of that uh, uh, maintenance, and that way, us participating into the project, and that way, when we come to our fourth iteration of our product, we don't need to redevelop this again. Um, also, this one one piece, but then there's an another piece, a more subtle but perhaps even more important layer, is that when the companies uh, uh, do this, they gain influence to the project, they gain possibility to, to uh, uh, direct the project, to give, uh, to, give, to give the project in a way uh, uh, to determine, well not alone, but to impact on where does the project go, what are the new features, what are the next features, what, what technologies will be sub supported in the next versions of the open source project, and all that, and, and, and that's, that has a, a uh, impact on, that has an impact on on, on how the company's own offering will uh, fare in the future. So if they can guarantee that the open source project goes into their direction, they are in a better position if the open source project would go into an another direction. And, and by gain, slowly gaining access into the central, into the open source project central to the company, they are in fact also 
influencing the project to, to support their business. Of course, this also re, uh, um, means a, a being part of the community, um, community formed of other companies, uh, uh, individuals, other organizations. Uh, uh, they get more um, open innovation style feedback. They, they, they get more engagement out of the community. That's also a meaningful way of working for developers. Today, if we look at the um, popular technologies that companies are developing on, the, the talent is scarce. And it's, uh, 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 many, or many companies are all the time on the lookout of developers that have a suitable skill set. And uh, um, uh, so retaining that talent is important for companies. And, uh, and uh, thus having a great working environment and doing uh, uh, things that seem intelligible to the developers is, 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 is a benefit. So meaningful way of working for developers is, is, is also one benefit. Also, there's a risk management perspective. If you are a good corporate citizen and you are engaged with the community, it's less likely that you will get an adverse reaction to, to, to something what you do. Well, of, there are drawbacks also. Well, always when you work with the con community or with the project, you can't 100% control what they do. There are others that, that also decide. And that's, that's the life you have to li live with it. Uh, um, then the more important question where we come to the core core of today's, today's presentation is, is the relationship towards competitors. When you work with open source projects and you contribute to the project, you, you, you need to consider that what, what will your competitors see? And in practice, the end result is that companies should, well, if there is no reason to not collaborate, then they absolutely should collaborate in areas where there is no or little competitive advantage for them. So uh, um, that's the, the, you know, the basic outcome for, for that, that. Of course, there is also some level of management required the how, how to participate into, into projects. But let, when I started working as a lawyer, uh, um, more, well, it's a little bit more than 15 years ago, but there was a point Perhaps in 2002, 2001, I was negotiating a joint research and development contract between companies. And there were two companies involved, and it was difficult. Difficult agreeing on all the IPR and all the stuff. So, so in order to do something uh, 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 collaboratively between two companies, you needed to first negotiate a contract. And, and it wasn't simple. So if you think about Linux kernel and all those companies, so, uh, uh, and, and the simplicity, entering into that, co that collaboration, is, is, it's far, far easier. Still, there is some management uh, uh, involved. So uh, this, this is to help to illustrate what are the areas actually where you should collaborate. And, and this picture here is to, uh, um, is to illustrate, the, the, in a way, the entire software solution supplied to customers by, by a company. And, and in the piece of software, there might be an area that's the, that is the competitive advantage of the company, but there, uh, uh, but there most certainly is a very large area of the piece of software that's, that is not the advantage, competitive advantage of, of the company. Competitive advantage means the reason why our customer chooses us instead of our competitor. That's, that, that's the, in a way, the reason why we get the money uh, uh, instead of, of, of the neighbor, neighboring guy. Uh, and, and so you need to, when you do an offering a software solution, you, have, you need to tackle a lot of, a lot of uh, um, uh, questions, and most of those are not as part of your competitive advantage. So when you see this and you realize that, hey, where is actually our competitive advantage? And, and you can define that, hey, it's this area. It means that there is a huge area where we should do whatever we can to, to lower our cost of development, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to increase efficiency, increase speed, 
uh, and that's the area where you should contribute to open source projects wherever you can. When it comes to the competitive advantage, then I don't say that it's an automatic no answer, but it's an answer that requires more, more uh, uh, whether to contribute or not, um, it requires more thought. Here's uh, how Bosch thinks about a few years back, uh, a slide from Bosch, how they think about why they should start contributing into an you know, uh, uh, open source project IoT platform. And, and while this uh, one company's view, I think the general logic in how this works is pretty much similar to most, most companies. They have a variety of, of, of verticals, Bosch, mobility, industry, energy building. They use software in all of these. Uh, uh, interconnections and interoperability between different devices and services what, what this, within these verticals uh, uh, requires, well, is required for, for them for them to work. And, and, and in a way, when they look at the Internet of Things future, there will be a lot of devices that are connected to services. And uh, um, they will need an IoT platform to manage all of that. And that's everyone in the field will need some, some type of IoT platform to manage devices uh, uh, and connect those to the services and, and do all the things that's necessary for, for that picture to work. So they are assuming, so Bosch assumed one and a half year back, I believe, uh, that they there will be two to five major Internet of Things platforms in the next five to seven years. At least one of them will be open source. Bosch thinks that with their resources, they will not be able to develop a proprietary platform alone. And, and uh, even if they would, their customers and partners would not accept it. So if they deliver to Daimler-Benz, Daimler-Benz would likely not want to have an IoT platform that's controlled only by Bosch. Uh, um, which is, I agree, that, that, that's how it's. And also on the other side, Bosch doesn't want a risk or dependency themselves to be dependent on a third party, say, uh, uh, say Oracle, or, or third-party IoT platform, proprietary IoT platform. So they conclude that they will need to support an open source platform. They will start contributing to an open source platform, the one they think will be the right horse. That's Let's move forward. That was about contributing to projects, supporting projects. Now, uh, uh, why do we op open up entire products, not just make a proprietary product more effectively uh, with the help of open source and the open source community, but to open up entire products? And I, I'll give you uh, a good example, Vardin.com. Vardin is a framework for Java developers. Java is one of the, well, perhaps the most popular uh, web development framework, web, web development technology. Vardin has a, um, offers an open source platform for that. They give away their open source platform for free to gain market share. And that's pretty much uh, uh, one of the very basic reasons why do you give away something for free? Well, that's to gain market share. Gain those developers who use your, in, in this case it's developers, who use Vardin solution to uh, help them do their work. And what's the result uh, uh, in, in, in terms of Vardin? Actually, it's a very good example because they tried as a proprietary solution from 2001 onwards. They, they tried as a proprietary solution. And that was, that's the result for the, how much money they got. And that's the result how much interest they had on their website. So not much. When they opened in 2009, so you can see, they opened up, they got a lot of more interest on Vardin.com. Uh, uh, here you can see it's, it's the amounts here are marginal, they aren't showing. Uh, uh, well, then, the, of course, the interest on Vardin, visits to Vardin.com, uh, well, from the marginal perspective there, they skyrocketed. 
uh, uh, anyhow, they increased heavily. And uh, a year or two, back, uh, a little bit on the later curve, they increased heavily also on the income. So what do they make their income out of? They have a fully open source platform. A lot of, via Vardin.com, they have a lot of open source third party add-ons and so on. Via Vardin.com, you can also purchase Pro Tools. These are proprietary tools by third parties, not by Vardin.com, by third parties. They are selling them via Vardin.com because that's the best marketplace to sell them, and Vardin gets a share. They are selling support, they are selling training, they are selling services. They are selling, in fact, pretty much all the standard things you sell on top of an open source project. Some projects sell, concentrate on support, some concentrate on services. Here they have, a, uh, they have the, in a way, the, the, uh, all of the different, different areas. But the logic here is the more users you have, the more demand you will have for all of these uh, uh, payable services. If you have uh, 100 users, you won't have much demand, but if you have 150,000 users as they had last, uh, uh, a little bit less than a year ago, uh, uh, well, you have far more demand. And, and uh, they are currently, I think they had last autumn, they had some four to five percent of Java developers in the world was their market share worldwide. And uh, uh, it would be, I would say, it would be a difficult for a smallish Finnish company or any smallish company to, to attain that type of market share without open source solution. So why do you open products? You open them to gain market share. Or you open them uh, uh, to gain users and gain revenue. Or then uh, uh, a third, the third bullet point here is an another type of you can do a strategical opening in order to impact your competitors. You can perhaps want to make hard, you want to make it more difficult for your competitor at a certain time of time. Or you might want to, in a way, make it easier for your customers to embark on your uh, um, payable services by, by doing an open source management platform, for example. Or you, and then uh, often this involves disrupting others. For some it may be the most important reasons, for others it may be a, a, a side effect. So, for if we think about Vardin.com here, this no longer is about, this, this same pyramid, pyramid, it's no longer about, um, it's no longer about software, it's about the whole offering. So in fact, the competitive advantage of Vardin is not in their software. The entire end, end part of the pyramid is, is the software part. The competitive advantage is, in this case, it's in the Vardin.com brand. That's pretty much what it is. Uh, to, to an extent, it may be also in the data. I don't know exactly. But the fact that there is a lot of users the user community around user community and the Vardin.com brand and that ecosystem is in a way their competitive advantage. A viewpoint regarding open data. I actually Matti Rossi was planned to speak about, but but he he had to cancel. Uh, I actually took a look at his slides and. Uh, uh, have some refer references here. In general, I think that the, uh, oh, about when you open data, you do a similar type of thing that when you open software, you, you create more value to the ecosystem, to the, to the, uh, um, to the um, if you look at the big picture. And, and then what then happens out of that value is then the uh, next thing. So, um, about Matt, Matti Rossi had identified that, uh, an, a couple of more, but I, I raise up these businesses around extracting and transforming open data. Business about analyzing open data, perhaps together with closed data. Uh, uh, and businesses about 
doing a, a some type of, for example, application user experience, uh, providing user experience based on open data. Um, so these type of new businesses are actually created um, to others than the data publisher itself. These are like possibilities for, for, for others. The data publisher can benefit out of the data analysis part, perhaps together with uh, uh, other open data uh, um, and put together with their closed data. So they can in a way benefit out of that. But that's, yeah. And then, uh, um, then there are also these type of, let's say, benefits that come out of the ecosystem. Once you're working with the ecosystem, you are, uh, you are forced to specify the data in a more uh, uh, um, detailed manner. That will help you making your systems and processes inter more interoperable, interoperable and that helps you prevent lock when the lock-in, that helps you create transparency and, and quality control. And then lastly, I have a slide about all the research of viewpoint. If we, if we, before looking at those questions there, if we think about the company perspective, in fact, it means that you have, for a company, you need to identify a competitive advantage. Where is your competitive advantage? Uh, and then, what is not in your competitive advantage? You should likely do your utmost to publish it to all everyone in the world, to get it to the hands of everyone, so that once they get that starting point, they will, they, that will, in a way, enable them to do something with your competitive advantage. And that will help them, uh, um, that will help you to get revenue uh, um, by way of being. So in a way, you control the area of your competitive advantage, but at the same time, you disseminate as much as possible the areas that are not within your competitive advantage. And uh, uh, in that way, you get Vardin.com publishes the entire software platform, uh, uh, and that way they get users and demand for their training services for the, um, for the ecosystem that they provide via Vardin.com, the, the add-ons, the, the consulting and all that. Um, so from a researcher po point of view, you need to think, where is a competitive advantage of a researcher? And, and I, um, well, that depends, of course, on case and, and, and uh, well, it might be a researcher group and uh, uh, it might be an institute or or a wider, uh, wider uh, um, organization, but I would say that it likely is not in the papers, in the papers that are published. That that's likely is not the competitive advantage, but 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 that's you you will need to consider that. And how do you? I would well I would say that the competitive advantage is more in the what you have in your head, your ability to process data, to to make conclusions, to to. To, to, uh, um, to do research on new stuff. The, the methodology you are learned, you learn to ap apply or the methodologies you can create or create. Uh, um, and, uh, and then of course your competitive advantage may also be in, your, in the connections you have, the persons you know in, in, uh, in uh, international universities or, or within Finland, in, in funders, uh, um, uh, all, all that can also be a competitive advantage. So how do you best maintain and improve that competitive advantage? So, uh, um, so I'd say that if we go back to this, um, if we go back to this, what companies did, you likely should disseminate as much of your non-competitive advantage, get it to the hands of as many as possible, so that they will come to you and ask, ask or they will discuss with you the, the uh, actual questions of, of research. And, and uh, um, well, I had here an example, but I'll skip that. The CSC has an uh, open source project. That's, in fact, that's a tool that they are publishing as open source, and I, I believe that helps them to maintain them as a hub hub of, or in the center of, of, of the, the global knowledge around that tool. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Martin.